evening. Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, political activist and musician Billy Bragg, Assistant Education Minister Susan Lee, Christian intellectual Miroslav Wolf, the Editor-in-Chief of The Hoopla, Wendy Harmer, and Shadow Environment Minister Mark Butler. Please welcome our panel. Thank you, and as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio, and you can join the Twitter conversation or send us a question by using the Quanda hashtag that just appeared on your screen. Well, our first question tonight comes from Rodrigo Salinas. Thanks, Tony. My question for the panel is, is it fair or reasonable for the Minister for the Arts to seek to penalise arts organisations, such as the Biennale of Sydney, by threatening to remove public funding when these organisations decline to accept money from private donors that put them in a conflict of interest. Wendy Harmer. Oh, I get the big complex one first. Thanks, Tony. I think artists are here to challenge. They're, up to stand, they're to here to stand up to their principles and they are to shine a light in the dark places. I think they do us a great service, these artists, by... Um, refusing to take money from an organisation which is effectively has, has been um, characterised as running a, a Guantanamo Bay. I think this is actually perhaps quite unprecedented. And I think more than that, they do something else for the rest of us. They shine a light on the corporatisation of our world, which really begins the very first time your kids come home with a coupon from Hungry Jacks and say, hey, Mum, um, if I sell enough of these, I get some computer equipment or some sports equipment. I think we're all caught up with corporatisation and um, I, I thank these artists for stepping <laughs> out and standing up for what they so, believe So to go to the question, um, are you saying you don't believe it's fair or reasonable for the Attorney-General to threaten to penalise those artists? Oh, indeed I don't. And it is actually, as far as I understand, it's enshrined in the legislation, is it not, that the Attorney-General should have um, arm's length uh, when it comes to... Well, he's our art, arts minister in this case. Yes, uh, yes, thank, yes, quite right. He's both. Uh, he's both. <laughs> Uh, that he should have arm's length, he should be at arm's length when it comes to funding the arts. This is not only protect, to protect the artists, <coughs> but is also there to protect the minister who may be seen as um, engaging in fear or favour. So I think in this instance he's way, way off the mark. Let's hear from Susan Lee. Well, unsurprisingly, Tony, I, I don't agree with all of what Wendy says, although I do agree that the arts challenge us, they invigorate us, and particularly in regional Australia, they matter a great deal. What George Brandis has said is he's asked the Australia Council to develop some guidelines. I think it's important to note in this case that Transfield, the parent company of Transfield Services, owns a 12... It's just a 12% stake that we're talking about. I think a couple of the artists, and I believe there's not many, are having a little bit of a tantrum about this. I think it's really important that we recognise the role of corporate philanthropy. And look at the public <coughs> interest test. Governments cannot always step in and fund everything. And if generous donors are prepared to do exactly that, then we should allow them. And there aren't strings attached to those corporate donations. They're made out of generosity. They're not saying to the artists, you must produce, say, decide, and so on. And but I really I think that's important. Uh, Senator Brand has actually written mm. to the Australia Council asking it to come up with a policy to deny funding um, mm. to events or artists who refuse well, corporate uh, donations. Let's wait and see what. Let's wait and see what the Australia Council comes up with by way of policy. But so let's are remember. Are you distancing yourself from that letter? Uh, not at all. Not at all. No. Um, a letter's been written. A policy will be developed. The Arts Minister will consider it. Lots of people will have their say. And in the middle of this, we've got to recognise that people who donate to the arts in an era of scarce government funding, I think we all agree on that, uh, should be recognised, supported, and where those funds are made by corporates, they don't need to be contributed by government. Let's hear from Billy Bragg. Well, I think this, it's an example of the, uh, the corporatisation of culture. Uh, the, the world that we live in now, the, uh, it seems to me that the uh, corporations now have... Well, as, as, uh, as, as they say in the United States of America, corporations are people too. But artists also have... Um, the, you know, the best kind of artists have a, have a credibility, have a cachet, and having their name associated with something negative 
uh, can damage that. It's, it's very difficult to build up credibility. It's very easy to lose. I have a... Uh, uh, I, in my contract, I am allowed to refuse to go on stage at a festival if the stage is sponsored by a tobacco company. Uh, my father died of lung cancer when he was 52. I was 18 at the time. I just couldn't, in, in any clear conscience, do that. By the same token, I, you know, I drink beer. I go on, I'll go on a stage that's, that's sponsored by a beer company. So I think you know, it has to be left to the artist to decide who uh, they're willing to stand in front of. Because they're kind of asking quick, you to wear their T-shirt, if, yeah. you, if you know what I mean. You know. Just a quick follow-up on that, though. If artists do reject uh, private funding on moral grounds, should they also reject government funding if the government has a policy they don't agree with? Well, I mean, there, there is the problem. I mean, it's the, I think the same uh, uh, artistic credibility applies. You have to be careful who you have your photograph taken with. But they're taxpayer funds, aren't they? I mean, you know, they... They, it's almost, I suppose it's almost like money laundering, you know. They, they, they don't come direct from the corporation, you know. The, the, they come through government and they are, they are supplied by all taxpayers <coughs> of all stripe. Yeah. So I, it's I, that, but it's that arm's length thing you were talking about, right. Wendy. Provided it's arm's length and you yeah. don't end up having to have your photograph taken with the, the Minister for, for Arts and those kind of things, I think then, you know, you're comfortable with that. It should be an individual. I think it's a matter of individual choice rather than being imposed from above. Right, before we go any further, we've got another question on this subject and we'll bring in the other panellists after. That's from Peter Dadak. Thank you, Tony. Haven't the local and overseas artists who declined to take part in this year's Biennale actually harmed the art-loving public more than they have Transfield and the Australian government combined? Mark Butler. <coughs> Well, if I was a board member of uh, Biennale, I probably wouldn't have taken that decision. That wouldn't have been my personal decision. But the important thing is that politicians like me shouldn't have a say in this. Uh, I think what George Brandis has done is very, very wrong. Uh, and I think it um, reflects the form that the Howard government had in trying to use government funding as a lever to control the political activities of the non-government sector. We saw it particularly in the social services sector where there were gag clauses in government funding contracts that non-government, often church and charitable organisations, would, would lose their funding if they engaged in political advocacy, for example, over child poverty or refugees or a range of things like that. Uh, we passed some legislation last year prohibiting gag clauses. This is exactly in the same, in, in the same category. Politicians should stay away from this. It is absolutely critical to a vibrant civil society that arts organisations, that church and charitable organisations should be able to apply for government funding without an, an expectation that the Minister of the Day is going to try and control politically what they say in the community. Miroslav, can I bring you in and... Um... <laughs> This one just should reflect on how this happened. Uh, there was an open letter from a, an arts teacher, in fact, uh, criticising the Biennale for its connection with Transfield Holdings. Mm. Uh, the other company associated with Transfield is, is now running uh, the two major offshore mm. asylum seeker detention centres. So um, I'm just wondering whether you think there are ethical issues involved here for artists? Yeah, I think there are ethical issues involved for ar artists. I think <coughs> even broader than just artists, this kind of issue involves the relationship between a, a person and his work or her work and a kind of larger nexus in which they find themselves. And so I think that work is not simply a little contractual thing that I do and then I'm completely off the hook in terms of its impact, in terms of who I stand. Work is an expression of me as a person. So is also art. I stand for something as I do work and therefore I ought to reject payment by somebody who I don't think stands for values that I stand for. He, I think it's a long it, tradition, yeah, it's a long tradition uh, Christian tradition actually, to step back and not to do kinds of works that one doesn't think are ethically, morally responsible. Um, Susan, can I just get you to reflect on that? I mean, <laughs> do, you, uh, do you understand these artists standing on their rights to take a kind of moral position? Uh, look, artists can take a moral position and no one should judge them for doing that. I might not agree with it, 
but it's a perfectly valid philosophical position to isn't take. Senator, but the isn't point isn't is, Senator Brandis actually judging them, however? Uh, no. What Senator Brandis is saying that in the allocation of scarce resources, which is what government taxpayer dollars are, we need to determine whether corporate philanthropy is being rejected and is it appropriate that it is. So this is not about the decisions that the artists make, while we may not agree with them. Uh, picking up on, on Mark's remarks, this is about government. I mean, how can ministers not be involved in government spending but and where government than that, dollars Susan, go? It's more it's about how much we value the arts and the, and the paucity of money and funds we put into mm. it. And we hand it over to corporations to fund it. And we don't value our art and our culture in the way that we should. But you know, there are yes, big... Yes, we do. There are, yes, we do. There are big of splits. we value art and culture. Sorry, go on. You go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. I've right. I mean, it's, 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 it's not right to say we don't value art and culture. Well, we don't fund it we don't to that level that we should. Well, I mean, there will all be, always be arguments about insufficient funding, and I understand those. But to say that we don't value art and culture is quite wrong, Wendy. Um, we don't always agree on the types of art and culture that we value, um, but but, uh, but we but we love the arts. All of us do. But isn't it the issue that whether we value sufficiently freedom of conscience and ability to stand for something and then distance oneself, irrespective of uh, what the setup in which we find ourselves? What happens to the protest? What happens to critique of uh, of government? What happens to the critique of the moral state of, of, of the world? I think artists have the right to do that. We want them to do that. We should greet them when they do that. Each one of us has that right, has that responsibility to the larger public good. Well, because of ultimately, how do we... You know, if we feel strongly about what's happening, what Transfield are doing, how do we, as individuals, as citizens, how do we hold them to account? It's only by standing up and being counted, by saying, no, I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't want to be associated with this, that we are ultimately, in our own way, by stepping back, able to have some small, only small, but in, in, a, in, a, in a broader scope in society, to say, we hold you accountable for the actions of your company in this situation, and we're stepping back from it. It's the so only it's, weapon we have. So, Susan Lee, uh, we'll, we'll just come back to you. Surrounded as you are by opposing opinion. Um, I don't mind that at all. Well, well, I mean, does the government <clears throat> respect the right of those artists to make those choices? Of course it does. Artists can make choices, individuals can make choices, and, and governments the, and make the Biennale, decisions, and the Biennale, Biennale is a great event. And, and the Look, Biennale board? I, I don't, you know, I, I, uh, I agree with Mark. I would not have made that decision as a member of that board, but they did. Um, but to say that we don't value the arts as a result, what we are doing is monitoring government expenditure, which we need to do and which we must do. And we recognise that partnerships... You're monitoring the arts well, now, No, no, no. Are we? We, are, we, we need to be careful about how we, we spend money across the board. I'm not saying we're careful about who we give the money to. Where and how is, are we framing that then? Where there, are, where there are corporate, generous corporate philanthropists who are prepared to contribute, we need to recognise their contribution, respect <coughs> it, and By what? be concerned By some fragrant piece of work that they're going to enjoy. And be concerned if it's rejected. OK, I'm going to move along before more rhetorical questions flow across the panel. <laughs> uh, you're watching Q&A. The next question comes from Margaret Taylor. Thanks, Tony. Does the panel believe that a nuclear family, that is a father, a man, a mother, a woman, and subsequent children if desired, is the best recipe for a society to function optimally as God intended? Miroslav. Family is a long-standing tradition, uh, not just uh, of the uh, of a kind of uh, particular religion, but of the whole of humanity. I think we ought to do everything we can in order to support, um, encourage uh, healthy family family life. Um, now, you reject the idea of hiding your Christian ideas away in private. So, should Christians who fundamentally disagree with homosexuality, with gay marriage? Uh, with divorce even, with the other sorts of things which they see breaking down the nuclear family, mm. should they come out and make their case in public more often? Well, uh, I think everybody first should have the right to speak their own conscience. We talked about speaking out one's own conscience uh, in the context of the debate earlier. I think everybody should have right to say what they believe. I think it's important also for these groups, as for all other groups, to respect <laughs> the rights of others, to listen what others might have to say, and to engage in, uh, in a healthy debate. But I think we need, in our societies, plurality of, uh, of positions. 
And uh, I think it would be, it, it, it's a good thing to have a vigorous debate. So the questioner asks, if I'm not wrong, um, do you think that the nuclear family, that is a father, a man, a mother, a woman, and subsequent children is the way that God intended families to be? Well, I think it's the best way for family, for family, uh, for family to be. I think um, families uh, exist in various types, various stripes, uh, and I think uh, there should be other families as well. I think I don't <coughs> think the state should legislate uh, against uh, against gay marriage. Susan, <laughs> Susan Lee, the, we'll go back to the question: Is a nuclear family, as we just outlined, is that the? the best way for society to function as God intended? That was the question. Uh, Tony, in the modern world, families come in all shapes and sizes and they don't always look like a nuclear family. But I do believe that at the heart of our society are nuclear families, but I would never say that a nuclear family is better than an alternative sort of family. And as the dedicated minister in the government for children, I've seen too many children uh, disadvantaged mm. and abused in so-called normal families, not to know that the most important ingredient in any family is the love of the adult for the child. <laughs> Billy Bragg. Yeah. Well, I think that if God exists, you know, she is a compassionate God rather than a judgmental God. Mm. And that, you know... The, 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 the teaching of, that I know from the New Testament is, is summarised in the phrase, God is love. God is not heterosexual love, God is not gay love, God is love. And where there is love, where there can, you know, wherever there is love, there can be a family. That's the most important, as Susan was saying, I totally agree with what she said. Mark Butler. <coughs> well, I think we all agree. Um, I mean, yeah. but I, I think ascribing value to particular types of families is extraordinarily hurtful um, to members of those families, particularly to the children. Uh, I didn't grow up in a nuclear family like, like you describe, and many of my friends at school didn't either. Uh, and still back then, it wasn't too long ago, but still back then there was, there was judgment passed on divorced families in many cases, and that's incredibly hurtful to children to think that they're not from a family that's as good as a nuclear family, whether that's because of what God was supposed to have intended or because of some social norm. I think um, Billy's right. The, the, the criti critical ingredient of a, of a strong family and a strong upbringing of children is love. And that comes in a variety of forms. And I think us ascribing value to different types of family is incredibly hurtful and we should stop doing it. A uh, question of Margaret has a hand up. I'm saying that a, an ideal society consists of loving families. Um, it's, it's well known that society functions better with loving families. That's Wendy, all right, well, thank you very I, much. Wendy Hammer. I'd just like to phone a friend, and that's my daughter Maeve, who loves Modern Family on TV with a passion. <laughs> and her idea of what the modern family is very, very different to anything that we grew up with. And, uh, you know... Everyone's right here. Everyone is absolutely in accordance that it is the heart and the feeling and the love and the care that goes into that unit. And it can be, you know, friends it, that you find when you're older, when your family doesn't suit you. You can find families absolutely everywhere. And I think we're all in, in, in accord on that. All right, I think we can know. We've got a hand up there. We'll go down to uh, this lady here. Quickly get a microphone to you. Just hang on for one second and go ahead. We all seem to agree, then why isn't gay marriage legalised? <laughs> Do you want to jump in on that one, Susan? Um, <laughs> look, uh, I think that it's an idea whose time hasn't quite come in the area of rural Australia and regional Australia that I represent. It's a question that gets raised with me, with me very rarely. I know it takes up a lot of bandwidth in public discourse. Uh, my 20-something children are quite relaxed about it and they say, come on, Mum, get over the line. Uh, well, two out of three of them do. Um, some people are concerned about some aspects and the fact that because marriage is defined as being between a man and a woman, does it matter that, that civil unions with <coughs> gay, gay people are not described as marriage? Um, and I am just so pleased that over the years, I've seen 
a lessening of discrimination, particularly in schools, particularly with young people struggling with their identity? I know that's not a great answer, but it'll, it reflects some of the, uh, uh, the feelings that I have and the different messages that come to me every day from the different parts of Australia. Do you have any sense as to when the time will be right, politically um, and socially in Australia? I couldn't pick a time, Tony, no. But you think that? generally that marriage is a good thing for society? I think marriage is a good thing. Well, that's society, good because there is no but... such thing as gay marriage. There is mm. only equal marriage. Mm. It's, if it's good for society, it's good for everyone in society, not just one group of people, for everyone. Okay, let's move along because we've got quite a bit to cover uh, in this program. Our next question is from Marianne Rakoshi. Um, yesterday, I marched alongside thousands of protesters at one of the 32 uh, March in March events. Um, and I'm here tonight as a young early childhood educator. Uh, really honestly worried about our nation's future. My question is for Susan Lee as the Minister in charge of early childhood education. Why won't you give back promised pay rises to my fellow 60,000 educators and be a strong advocate for quality reforms? Um. <laughs> Thank you, Marion. It's, um, it's nice to see you in the flesh. I see you on Twitter all the time. Uh, thank you for your passion for an industry that you care so much about. The important thing is that I do understand that quality is there, quality is a journey that we're on, and educators deserve professional wages, as you say. But the previous government put a, a a policy in place which was $300 million of borrowed money to give pay rises for just two years to just 15% of the sector in total. <coughs> and I think that's extremely unfair. What well, I you think give more than that. You actually call it a, uh, a childcare union slush a union. I have because the independent inquiry that we organised after coming into government found exactly that. This is a fund, Tony, that was exhausted in just 13 hours because it was so insufficient. But when I was sworn in as minister, the previous minister, the member for Adelaide, and uh, Mark knows he's part of the Union United Voice, so he may have something to say in a moment, uh, had not even had the decency to tell educators and centres to stop applying for this money because it was long gone. Because every time an application was made, a union EBA was created and more union memberships were signed up. But that doesn't mean, Marion, that I don't believe that you have a strong case. My point was, instead of running this campaign, this case should have gone to the Fair Work Commission, the independent umpire. And two years ago, when I met your union, I said, understand the case you're doing, which involves a lot of new members for your union, but why aren't you taking it to, to, to the Fair Work Commission? And, in fact, it has gone there now, and it will be heard, and at the end of that process, there's a strong expectation, I'm sure that you have, that if you make the case, professional wages will be in place and they will be sustainable. Okay, a question I had a hand up. I'll, I'll hear from her and then I'd like to hear from the uh, opposition. Um, yes, yeah, so you've just said that you do <coughs> believe it's unfair and um, that it will run its course through the Fair Work Commission. However, in The Australian, there was a loud and clear heading saying the coalition resists equal mm. pay claim. So I want to clarify with you now what... What was that about? The Fair Work Commission hearing is at its early framework and legislative stage. So no proposal has been made by the Commonwealth about the merits of the case. We are literally talking about the legal framework. So the interpretation that you have made and you may have read is not correct. So my point is to you that the Fair Work Commission, we have always said, is the body to determine who should get the wage case? And do you really think it's fair that only 15% of your <coughs> sector would have been awarded a wage case for just two years and then lost it all without a proper sustainable increase for everybody? Mm -hmm. And just coincidentally that that 15% were encouraged to sign up to the okay, union? I'm going to interrupt. That's not fair. I, I, want to hear from, <coughs> uh, I want to hear from the other side of the argument. In government, you made this money available, but the point was well made. I mean, you couldn't pay for it. Well, that's not right. It was it was in the budget. I mean, the, well, hang on. The, is, the budget this, was this so deeply. Was the, the, well, no, just 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 go back to the point that I was just trying to make, and which you've just heard from the government. The the budget was so deeply in deficit by the time you handed it over to the new government that they had to find savings. This is the problem we have here. Uh, whenever there's a program or a line of spending this government doesn't like, they say, oh, it's borrowed money. And then at the same time, 
Instead of an emissions trading scheme, Tony Abbott will find five billion a year to pay polluters. He'll find five and a half billion to pay paid parental leave, which is more than the entire childcare budget every year that Susan has to spend. Uh, this this has been an issue for more than 20 years. For more than 20 years, childcare workers or educators have been subsidising high quality, affordable childcare in this country through accepting low wages. Uh, and it's unfair, it's unsustainable. The decision we took last year was never going to fix things overnight. It was a, you know, it was $300 million. It was to start a process of lifting wages in this sector. I'm glad Susan agrees that they're too lowly paid. This is not just unfair. We are not going to have the number of qualified educators that we need for our naught to five year olds if we don't fix this. And is, 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 it, tr is it true what the minister said that the pay rise was restricted to 15% of the workers? Well, there, were, there was limited money, as Susan says, there was, there was limited money, as there was in the aged care sector, which the government also tore down, to start a process of lifting wages. You cannot just go to the Fair Work Commission now, uh, click your fingers, and, and, and deal with an entire sector in the way you could 25 so years ago. So 15% is you correct, is it? Do it? You have to do it through enterprise bargaining so Mark, and start you, a market-based process. Are you saying that your own uh, Fair Work Commission is not cut out for the job? Of course it is, but then well, what then we need to do then is start to flow it through. Look, there have been these arguments for years and years. Through the 11 years of the Howard government, you know, there have been arguments about whether you can lift childcare workers' wages by taking a case to the Industrial Commission, which is what we would have done and did 25 years ago. The, end, the system of enterprise bargaining that was introduced almost quarter of a century ago simply disadvantages workers like childcare workers, aged care workers, service, service sector workers generally. We tried to find a way to deal with a problem that's been in the too hard basket for 20 years because frankly it's beyond time that early childhood educators got a fair wage for the incredibly uh, important uh, work. It was no, 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 incredibly we'll get... unfair. It was an incredibly unfair process and just coincidentally everyone who won under that process was a union member. <laughs> okay, hold on, I'm just going right. to quickly and, and, go, no, gonna quickly go right, back to our well, question. You do not was... have to be a union member to be covered by the agreement. Excuse so me, excuse those, me, those sorry. Just that nobody told hold on, hold on, because we've got a lot of topics to get through. I'll just quickly go back and give the last word to the question and then I'll hand up again. Um, sorry. Lastly, I just wanted to say, um, with so many issues, early childhood education being one of them, it seems like the current government immediately goes to Labor's policies or anything they've done in the past. I want to focus on now and the future. So what will be your legacy on early childhood, Susan? Uh, the Productivity Commission that is currently taking hearings and about to produce a draft report in July and a final one in October will set brave new policy parameters for the future. So childcare will not look the way it does now. And that's a very big once in a generation approach that we're taking. And it's absolutely focused on the future. OK, thank you very much. We've got a lot of other topics to get to. Our next question comes from Daniel Iacchini. Uh, my question is to the panel. Um, I'm a trained molecular biologist and I accept the obvious facts surrounding evolution, uh, promote scientific advancement, um, I support marriage equality and I'm pro-choice. Um, I despise the corruption scandals that are currently happening in the church and I scorn the priests involved in, uh, in the sex abuse. Yet I can still comfortably say uh, that I believe in God and I think he would have very similar views on the matter. So why does actor Chris O'Dowd believe that um, believing in a religion will one day be as offensive as racism. Miroslav, have you heard these comments from I, the actor? Yeah. I did hear it. It just strikes me just a tiny bit bigoted uh, to, to make a claim that like this. And I, it also strikes me as a somewhat misinformed, bigoted, because, uh, you know, I feel like I'm being... Uh, Labelled as a as a racist uh, because I very sturdily embrace uh, my faith, but I think it's probably more important that it's misinformed. Uh, religions today are growing not just in absolute terms, but are growing also in relative terms. For instance, uh, Christianity grew from 75 to 2005 from 1.3 billion to 2.1 billion. Islam grew from uh, 554 billion to 1.3 billion and so forth, right? And its growth in absolute and also relative terms. I think we live in religiously pluralistic world or worldview pluralistic world and sooner we realize that and therefore sooner we embrace that kind of a world and accord equal rights to all citizens whether they're religious or not and organize our societies, make uh, democracies uh, faith-friendly democracies, 
uh, sooner we will have uh, rights of all citizens respected and their ability to articulate, their ability to live there and lead their lives, contribute to leading their lives as they see fit, which is by definition character of democracy. That's why I think it's kind of uh, misguided. It's not going to happen. It's kind of ideology. Uh, and it's a projection of wishful thinking based, I think, maybe on the assumption that uh, religions are inherently and by nature uh, violent, maybe irrational, and so forth. And I would say, I think what's irrational, what's violent, is when religions align themselves and become, with, with a given society, become boundary markers and align themselves with the position of power. Once you separate the religion from power, then religion can be politically, publicly engaged, and you don't have either secular exclusion of religion nor religious domination of society, but you've got a vibrant, pluralistic society debating the nature of the good life. Uh, Billy Bragg, do you like this form of religion? <laughs> well, as it's described. I mean, uh, as, as a socialist, I want to live in a multicultural society, and that does involve respecting some things that you yourself don't necessarily adhere to. That's a, a very important uh, a part of it. And, and I think what, you know, aside from the actions of religions, to respect the views of people of faith and to take them as, as other opinions, as you would respect, you know, the views of, say, a politician. You know, we hear lots of bad things about politicians. I have to have a lot of respect for politicians. They, they spend a lot of time away from their families. They work very hard on our behalf. Some of them spend their entire lives and never really manage to, to make a mark. I have a lot of respect for them. And I think it should be the same with people of faith. You have to judge each individual on, on how you find them, rather than uh, just make <coughs> such, such sweeping statements about religion. Wendy Harmer. Well, I, I really do believe mm. that um, that religious people should be at the table when we discuss the kind of society that we want. Uh, we have a commission of audit at the moment which is apparently looking at the way we're going to structure our society and these are economists. You know, there's no old... Um, there's no uh, workers there, there's no unionists, there's no environmentalists, there are no, you know, um, humanist philosophers. These are uh, all the people that I would like to see, you know, be dealt in when we really look at the sort of society that we want rather than just a bunch of bean counters. Mm -hmm. So on that basis I say yes, but I would also say to you that we, uh, who are not believers, <coughs> would very much hope that you would step up your work on interfaith dialogue so that we, we don't have all these religions fighting each other. And I think that that is the work that, um, that most of us who are not believers would like to see believers do more of. I'll get you to respond to that, Miroslav. Go ahead. Yeah, but, but, uh, I think that's right. Uh, I myself am involved in interfaith dialogue. I think it's a very important thing. But let's step back and, and realise that actually interfaith conflicts are uh, in the 20th century were not prevalent mode of conflict. Mm. It's actually uh, secular ideologies with regard to fates and oppression of fates that have been much more dominant in the 20th century. So mm -hmm. I think what we have a problem of ideologies and their interrelations uh, with one another, and I think we need to uh, attend that issue. And I think uh, we need to find ways in which we can respect not just individual persons, religious persons, qua persons, but also uh, find space for their articulations of the good life to be discussed, to be heard, uh, their reasons to be heard. For instance, I teach a course at Yale. It's called Life Worth Living. And that course at Yale is, uh, we discuss uh, six uh, figures. Buddha, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, John Stuart Mill, and Nietzsche. And each one of them is being discussed as making claim, truth, truth claim upon our lives, not as a distant figure out there. And we ask students uh, every time the question, how would your life have to change if you were a follower of this way of life? And so what we try to do is to stimulate discussion about the implications of articulations of variety of ways of living in order to stimulate a multicultural society, multi-religious societies in which each has the right 
to speak into public that, wouldn't sphere. Wouldn't that be wonderful to see in our schools, you know, that kind of study? I mean, that would be fantastic. Uh, can I just quickly uh, pick up a point you made earlier? If I, if I heard you correctly, you're saying that you, religious people should separate themselves from politics or religion should separate itself from power. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think that's exactly right. So what about, uh, so, so, so how should um, deeply religious polit politicians behave? Well, deep religious politicians, uh, I think uh, they have to, uh, in, in some sense, separate uh, the kind of the, their private beliefs from their some public beliefs. Uh, I think uh, if they have been chosen as those who stand for a particular religious uh, vision of a way of life, then they should be, have right to articulate that, that vision. But I don't think the politicians should... Um, think that they have a kind of phone line to, to heaven and then dial up uh, whenever the problem uh, arises, what do we do? And then uh, we, we have a response uh, for, from God and that kind of settles, settles the matter. Listen, I'm a theologian. I write books and I never think of my books as being kind of sanctioned by God. I put them out for discussion and they are there in order to engage the debate. Does Politicians he, should do the same. Does so the he same read them? The, 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 the same goes surely for atheist and agnostic politicians. I mean, yeah. it's important that they separate. I'm not a religious person. It's important that we separate our views about religion from the job we have in politics. We went through a very long debate uh, in the Labor Party about this and around state aid to non-government schools, particularly to religious schools. I mean, the, the, view, uh, the view Chris A. Dowd uh, put there is a deeply intolerant view, a deeply intolerant view. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but I know that, uh, that religions, particularly the communal religions that have been uh, prevalent here in Australia, have contributed an extraordinary amount to our ethical underpinnings, particularly about how capitalism works here and we should we should nurture that we don't want to discard it even if we're not religious we should nurture that but it is right that churches unions political parties to have a social license need to clean up their act and there is still much unfinished business that the church has to do around child abuse and the royal commission will do a lot of that work i hope here in australia but there still is a strong obligation on a number of the churches and other institutions that engaged in some absolutely terrible behaviour in decades past that needs to be cleaned up. All right, I just want to hear from uh, Susan Lee. I mean, uh, Susan Lee, I beg your pardon. The, um, the whole notion of uh, politicians who are religious, obviously it, it has uh, relevance because we have a deeply religious Prime Minister. But we have a secular government and it reflects our Judeo-Christian heritage and it underpins most of what we do. But we don't make laws based on our personal religion in this country. I do agree with Wendy about the need for interfaith dialogue. Having grown up in Muslim countries, I uh, would like very much to see the message of moderate Islam spread into our schools to promote greater understanding. And I think faith is a good thing. Um, I think it's easy to bag the churches. I'm a very flawed Christian myself. Um, and I don't make a judgment on anybody based on their religious beliefs, but I think overwhelmingly faith is a good thing. Wherever you find it and however you come to it, um, it makes you a better person and society the better for you. OK, let's go to our next question. It's on a similar topic. It's from uh, Rudd Eridan. Um, my question is uh, to Billy Bragg um, and to the other panellists. Do you agree with Miroslav Volf that Pope Francis uh, has replaced arrogance with humility and if so, do you think there is a possibility that practising Christianity in humility could well be a great antidote to racism and other offensive and unacceptable phenomena? Well, I, th I think it's great that uh, uh, the leader of, uh, of um, the Catholic Church should come out in the way he has and approach the papacy in the I way... I don't work for him, by the way. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, but the, the, but the, the very fact that he's, he's trying to engage with, with the world as it is rather than the the spiritual temporal world inside the Vatican. I think that's very positive for Christianity because um, I think in, in a modern society, I mean, you mentioned the number of people who are uh, more Christians, uh, becoming Christians. That's certainly not true in Western Europe. Uh, Christianity is, is declining in, in British society. It's, it's falling away. Church attendances are falling away. Uh, um, in, a, in a phenomenal way. London. Well, that's that's <laughs> m many. The people in London yeah. tend to be Africans no, in the churches no, no, in London. Well, there, it, there's a big, you know, there's a big. Go to HTB in London, and you'll see a vibrant, vibrant, uh, very educated. Uh, 
But for a, for a, a, a religious fig figure to engage with the, the elements of, uh, of Christianity as preached by Christ in the, in the New Testament, the, you know, the, the Christ who, who threw the moneylenders out of the temple, that kind of Christianity, I think, still resonates with a lot of people. If the Pope is going to talk about equality, uh, um, not just humility, then I think you know, that's, that is a, a genuine positive thing for people of all faiths. I'll just quickly go back to a uh, question, because uh, Rade, you're a Serbian Orthodox uh, priest, but uh, yes, look, uh, looking at the, um, the Pope, Pope Francis, um, are you taking inspiration from him? Is that what you're saying? Um, I couldn't say inspiration, but he's, he's an impressive man. And um, mm -hmm. I think that, um, I mean, if Wendy Harmer, I believe, uh, is, a, is, a, is a fan of his as well from, a, uh, from, from some perspective. Yes, um, as a non-believer, if you can be inspired by uh, the Pope, I, I think as an Orthodox priest, I can be very impressed by him indeed um, and by many of the things that he says and does. Perfect so, throw yeah. to Wendy Harmer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason that I'm so Im impressed with Pope Francis is his um, concentration on environmental matters. Um, he is the leader of uh, one billion people around the world, and many of them in African nations and in South America, where very big uh, decisions about, are being made environmentally. And uh, he has, I think, so beautifully reframed um, the Christian or the Catholic view of what the environment is. And he says um, that every time a a place is a, you know, becomes a desert or, or the environment is um, assaulted, that we can feel that as a personal disfigurement. That's what he says. So there's a very, very close embrace there. And that is so different from the idea that Tony Abbott, ha Abbott has about the forest, that, you know, the greens are evil and they're the devil. This is evangelist thinking. I mean, Tony Abbott's now saying that, you know, we have to husband the forest. And I think this is just a licence to screw them, quite frankly. <laughs> um, <All right. laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm going to throw to, uh, just to respond to that, I'm going to throw to, I was going to go to the uh, Shadow Environment Minister, but <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you, you, can, you can come back to that. Wendy, I want to invite you to the New South Wales River Red Gum Forests on the Murray and look at the travesty of locking up that, that forest and the fact that now there isn't a sustainable red gum timber industry. There is a forest that uh, you can't get into, you can't get out of, that is growing saplings like weeds in a completely unsustainable way, that is getting full of weeds and feral animals that may well one day burn well, and burn be lost. Just burn it down then, that's probably the best But, I mean, but I mean, you, Barry but... O'Farrell has just said that he's going to start burning native timber for electricity. Susan, this goes back to the 1960s. It's absurd. All I, want, you, all I want Wendy to do is yep. to come down and visit the communities that I represent, the communities <clears throat> that are close to closing because of an action that actually makes no sense environmentally or economically. So are you, say, so are you saying that uh, we should uh, hold on to our seatbelts because Tasmania might not be the only place where uh, forests are opened up for logging? I'm saying, I'm, well, I'm saying that sustainable logging of forests is a good thing and... It, it sounds like a, you're making a case for opening up more forests. <laughs> well, this forest was closed only a few years ago mm. and, and it was underpinned by huge again in misunderstandings. Well, it's not a decision for us, it's actually a decision for, uh, for the state government and they are allowing okay. some thinning trials and right. they are overcoming a decision of the previous government. But I just, uh, you, you know, if you, if you don't come and have a look, you don't really understand and so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticising Wendy's opinion, she's entitled to have it, but I would... Right. Uh, I would I like just, her to see what I see. We got here from Pope Francis and there was someone who had their hand up <laughs> down there. I, I presume on that topic. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, more Pope Francis than the forest. Sorry. Um, I guess my question comes from with the increasing persecution of, of people of faith um, around the world that's happening. And then we see in the media in Australia constant ridicule and mockery of anyone of the Christian faith. It seems to be open slather. Um, and I've, I've got to say, more so Christians, we don't tend to mock Buddhism, Hinduism, atheism um, or anything else. How do we raise our children in what is so-called a, a, a country that's based on Christian principles? And obviously, I, I'm a Christian and raising my children. And when, how do we change the way the media seems to completely trash anything that is that is Christian? Well, partly by having conversations like this, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear from Miroslav on it. You know, obviously, I'm not going to endorse um, 
uh, media trashing Christianity. I don't know very well Australian situation, but I can tell you, I grew up in a society that was radically secular, that was completely in the domination of the Communist Party, uh, and the whole media was uh, was kind of education media. Whole government was shaped from that perspective. To be a Christian was to be a second, third class uh, citizen. You know, I don't think it did me harm. I think uh, it's a good well, apart, thing. Apart from when they tortured you, of course. <laughs> you know, but even even you know, it's not a good thing, right? But but in a sense, uh, in a sense, you can you uh, I can say for myself, I really grew out of it. I think it was a profound experience uh, for me that shaped me in a way that made me a better better person. I don't make that uh, general judgment in any way to justify, of course, so, persecution. Yeah, but does, does, that mean, does that mean persecution? Um, and I mean this sort of just following your line of thought. Persecution can actually be good for you. Well, you, you, know, you, no, you can make good out of persecution, mm -hmm. right? But for the church, where I was heading with this comment, is for the church to be marginal, isn't that bad of a thing? Church was born as a marginal institution. For many, many centuries, it stayed as a marginal institution. And I think if we are detached from power, we can see things much more clearly. We can, uh, we can project uh, uh, authentic Christian vision much, more, uh, mu mu much better. I think it's healthy for the church to learn how to live from the margins and contribute from the margins to the well-being of society. Uh, so let's hear Billy on that. Well, I was just thinking, if you feel if you feel persecuted as a Christian, you should try being a socialist. <laughs> if you want to, you know, sort of, and in some ways, you know, we're 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 you know we're in a we're in a similar boat. You know, we're we you know the the great ideologies Miroslav touched on. You know, the great ideologies that that uh, dominated the 20th century have passed, and 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 those those idea the idea of a compassionate society is harder to pin down. Now, and I think we have some common ground in there, compassionate Christianity, and I believe that, personally, I believe that uh, uh, socialism, if it is not at, at heart a form of organised compassion, isn't really worthy of the name socialism. So I think there is some common ground to be found between the sort of compassionate Christianity that you're talking about and what we're trying to do for a fairer society. Um, OK, we're going to move on. Uh, we've got another... I'm oh, sorry, we've got a few people with their hands up. Sorry about that. But we have a question from Leonie Wainwright. Where's Leonie? Down here. All right, we're, we've lost Leonie. There she is. Yeah, my question was for um, Miroslav. Um, the Northern Territory government is considering laws to prevent women drinking excessively during pregnancy due to growing numbers of Northern Territory children growing up with fetal alcohol syndrome. This proposal raises significant conflict in the minds of many people because although the well-being of children is something most people will agree is paramount, it involves a moral standard being applied to a group of people without their consent. Do you see a parallel with Christians <coughs> advocating for Christian values in the public arena? Miroslav. Yeah, no, no, I don't, uh, actually. Uh, I think I very much agree uh, with you. Uh, and uh, if I understand correctly the situation, I don't think we should selectively apply laws. If these law laws apply, they should apply across the board, and it shouldn't be. They shouldn't be an expression of a kind of hidden uh, racism, hidden behind the, the veil of of care for a particular particular group. So I realize that the problem is very complex, that I can't quite speak uh, fully to it. But it seems to me that equality is a very significant issue here. And I think in terms of, uh, in terms of Christian faith, um, I think uh, all other world religions, actually, the, the, the great invention of the world religion is individual attention to individual human being qua human being. Most fundamentally great religious faiths are fundamentally anti-racist. They're fundamentally anti-parochial, and they thematize uh, humanity as a whole, and therefore care for every human being, equal care for every human being, is a fundamental, certainly to Christian faith, but for other faiths so as well. So are you saying it would be actually racist, is this your view, to single out uh, Aboriginal women in these circumstances and not apply such a rule right across the board to the whole country? Given the history of the relationship to, to Aborigines, I am afraid that that 
that's the direction where it, where it might go. Susan Lee. Um, Tony, I haven't spoken to anyone in the Northern Territory Government about this, so I don't want to make blanket statements. But instinctively, uh, I feel very concerned about a law that tells a woman what she can and can't do with her body. Um, it's not about Le it's not so much about legislation around these issues, it's about education and I know that's easy to say and I know that medical practitioners, some of whom I have met who have dealt with babies with foetal alcohol syndrome, are absolutely furious on their behalf and desperately angry and committed to doing something about it. So let's not doubt that behind this there is goodwill. The, the debate in the Northern but Territory, uh, the way the Attorney General puts it, will be framed around the rights of the unborn child as opposed to the rights of the mother. In other words, saying the rights of the unborn child are being ignored. That would be his argument. Again, instinctively, I feel it's difficult to, to challenge a woman about what she can and can't do with her body. But there are, there are women who, who need help and that help needs to be brought to them. And I know that's not easy, but we must care about the women just as much as the unborn So you're saying child. don't do it with criminal sanctions, in other words? Uh, I haven't heard that criminal sanctions are being proposed. As oh, I said, I haven't are. actually talked to anyone yeah. in the Northern Territory about they it. They are. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this is happening in a number of states in the US. Uh, it, it, is, it raises very significant legal and ethical issues about, uh, about um, fetal rights and... and um, uh, and if, uh, if a woman is able to be subject to criminal sanctions for, for damage that might be done to the foetus because of alcohol abuse, um, you know, I think it is a very significant slippery slope into a whole range of other legal ramifications that many of us have been dealing with for many years. Uh, so this is a very important line to cross. But I, but I think even if you're not with me on that, the legal and ethical consequences of the the laws that the Northern Territory Attorney General has raised, at a practical level, they just don't work. Mm. They just, it just doesn't work mm. to tell a woman, a mother, pregnant mother, who has substance abuse issues, that we are going to lock you up. It is the best, best recipe for making sure they don't seek help. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the, the, at the end of the day, that's the practical problem with this idea. It looks good in a headline, but what it will do is lead to women who have substance or alcohol abuse issues um, hiding from medical help. This should be treated as a health issue, uh, not a criminal justice issue. Susan is right. There is much more that we should be doing about educating uh, women who are thinking about becoming pregnant or women who have substance abuse issues about the consequences of particularly alcohol abuse while pregnant. And, you know, there was some very good parliamentary inquiry work done last year that, that we uh, issued an initial response to. I hope the new government takes that up. Uh, but there is also a whole range of things we need to do to care for the many many people, not just in the Northern Territory, but across all of Australia, who, who now have foetal alcohol syndrome and who are being let down and often put in jail because there is not proper accommodation for them. It's an absolute disgrace. Mm -hmm. um, can I just bring that point to you? Uh, the Prime Minister said he would take a briefing on that issue mm -hmm. of, uh, of people with foetal alcohol syndrome being locked um, and with no chance of being let free, uh, locked up in prison. Uh, Tony, I haven't spoken to anyone in the Northern Territory about this and, of course, we're going to take briefings and hear their proposals uh, and we'll have conversations about it and everyone will have their say and I, I don't think we should overly characterise this as an issue about one side of politics against the oh, other. Right. And, and Mark's not doing it's that. Not. To, 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 to no, no, I know. Actually, I'm, so I'm, I'm, talking now specific, I'm talking now specifically about the <laughs> issue of, uh, of the young woman, for example, in uh, Western Australia who's been locked up indefinitely because she has foetal alcohol syndrome, she cannot stand trial. So mm. she's going to be kept in prison. Mm. Uh, obviously, we're concerned about a woman in that position, and I'm sure the West Australian government is too. But I'm, I'm not going to sit here and, and um, comment on what they're doing in a legal sense around one of the citizens of their state without knowing more about it than I do now. OK, we've got one time for one final question. It's from Nick Jensen. Hi, Nick. Thanks, Sonny. Uh, this is for Billy Bragg and Miroslav Volf. Uh, Mr Bragg, in the song Handyman Blues, you seem to lament your inability to fulfil the traditional masculine role around the house, something I can relate to. Do you think there is still a necessary uniqueness in gender roles, or should differences between males and females ultimately be deconstructed? And in theological terms, Professor Volf, did God intentionally create male and female? 
Let's hear from the whole panel briefly on this. Let's just say this. I'm never taking out the bins. You understand? <laughs> <laughs> <Let's go. laughs> I'll come back to you in a minute. I want to actually hear from the men on the panel first. Billy Bragg. Well, I mean, I think we, we all of us in some way measure ourselves on, the, on what our dads did. My dad was an amazing handyman. He could turn his... You know, he could make anything out of a bit of wood. I'm useless. I'm very, very... About those kinds, but he was also very bookish. My dad, he loved. He always had books around the house, and I, I seem to have inherited that side of his uh, of his, his uh, character. While well, my brother's a bricklayer, and he's got like, the, the practical side. But I think that for masculinity to be defined in purely terms of practical knowledge isn't it narrows down the definition of masculinity. I don't think masculinity is a, is even a fixed point or even a spectrum. I think it's a it's a a movable feast during a day. You know, some days I'm a kind of grumpy, grizzly guy in the morning before I've had my coffee. By the afternoon, I'm more sort of empathetic. You know, some days I'm applying practical knowledge that I have to do things. Other days I'm working more on intuition as a songwriter. But I don't think there's a fixed point of masculinity, and I don't wish to be judged by other men by the way they judge their masculinity. In some ways, it's it's for for each of us to find our own accommodation with with that aspect of it. Have you got? A, well, I was, uh, I'm thinking about things like in Sweden where schools have actually removed gender entirely. They don't use boy or girl, they use gender neutral language. And I can't help but feel that there's part of a uh, missing going well, on. Well, we did, we did that in rock and roll a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's never, it's never harmed. It didn't, right. go, it didn't hurt David Bowie, did it? We, we've, uh, <laughs> we've got to hear from the rest of the panel briefly. Uh, Miroslav, do you put any stock in the uniqueness of gender roles? I think God created male and female, as it says in Genesis, but not maleness and femaleness. I think maleness and femaleness is a question of cultural differentiation and, and kind of cultural play. And I don't play much stock uh, into that. I don't think there's theological, uh, theological uh, kind of weight to that distinction. It's controversial, what I'm saying theologically, but that's what I believe. And you I've believe written in, you, about you it. You believe in Genesis, do you? I believe in Genesis, but there's no... no, no I, yeah, sure, I believe in Genesis. <laughs> so, Adam's rib, the whole thing? Oh, but you, you've got to learn how to read those things, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's... Uh, and sorry. and you, have to, you have to read them not as a science book. You have to read them as what they are written for and about. Oh, we probably should have started with that discussion. Uh, <laughs> this is a folks' question, it's isn't it? A, yes. But I, I have a deep yearning in my soul to be able to hang a gate and to drill stuff. <laughs> um, my father was bloody hopeless at it. I'm bloody hopeless at it. Um, you know, I listened to your handyman blues at the Wayne Adelaide Festival last yeah. weekend and every woman who knows me laughed at me <laughs> uh, because they've seen me bugger up my house from plumbing to building to drilling holes in the walls. Uh, there I are just other so ways wish to I be creative, it. Mark, to and I, and, your yeah, creativity. I'm mate. awful at them as well, I think. Mean. Embrace the intuitive. Susan. I think we should celebrate our differences in gender, however we might describe them internally and externally. And in the childcare centres I visit across the country, I know that while every effort is made to get the little boys to do the girl things and vice versa, it often doesn't really work that well. Um, so the progress in Sweden is interesting. I think that's pushing it a bit too far and confusing for children. But um, I was always a tomboy and I've always done blokey things and I've never done any of them very well either. And what do you Me reckon, mate? <laughs> what do I reckon, mate? Well, I've been the, the, the breadwinner in my marriage for 20 years. My husband's always been the stay-at-home dad. And, you know, um, I left to him with a tiny, tiny baby of one month old and went back to work. And every girl in the neighbourhood wanted to have sex with him. <laughs> <laughs> because he was such a nurturing, gorgeous guy, just the same way they want to do with Billy Bragg tonight. <laughs> Let's hope that's not what happened. Uh, that is all we have time for. I'm home, right? That now. is all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Billy Bragg, Susan Lee, Miroslav Wolf, Wendy Harmer, and Mark Butler. And Billy, that is your cue. So then, for those of you who've been waiting for this, next, last week's Q&A included a robust debate about the Racial Discrimination Act, and during that discussion, 
Professor Marcia Langton made statements suggesting she believed that Mr Andrew Bolt was a racist. Later, Professor Langton publicly said that she does not believe Mr Bolt is a racist, although she profoundly disagrees with and disapproves of his views and statements on Aboriginality. She apologised to him for her comments and, as a result, the ABC also apologises for broadcasting her remarks. The specific disagreements between Marcia Langton and Andrew Bolt are too complex and detailed to broadcast here. But you can find more on our website and we've invited Andrew Bolt to join Q&A and explain his views in greater detail. Next Monday, Q&A will be in Melbourne with award-winning star of stage and screen Rachel Griffiths. Football and media icon Eddie Maguire, transport magnate Lindsay Fox, Liberal MP Kelly O'Dwyer and the shadow immigration minister Richard Miles. We'll leave you tonight with Billy Bragg's song, Andy Man Blues. We've just been talking about it. And joining him on stage is CJ Hillman. Until next week's Q&A, good night. <laughs>